Hey YouTube, you're watching Drone Dude, and today we're going to talk about uh, filming uh, technique, my setup, uh, what I do uh, when I get to where I am going to film, how I film, and uh, pretty much everything uh, in terms of filming uh, with a drone as such as the Inspire, of which I will be discussing today. So uh, let's get started. Okay guys, so uh, when taking the Inspire out, I just want to make sure I have everything with me. So we have the Master Remote and Slave Remote, iPad Air 2 and iPad Mini 3. We have uh, the two TB47 batteries and the Inspire, of course. Then we also have a camera stand to uh, make this video because uh, I will be filming the Inspire with the Canon 70. And so uh, I'm not going to be using the carrying case if I'm just going kind of a short distance. I can pop all of this in the back of the car, but uh, if I were to travel, I would definitely put all this in the carrying case and do that. All right, so we have everything packed up in the back of the car. Got two remotes. They're on this kind of carpet pad to keep them from sliding around. Uh, we got the tripod and the all-important baby stuffed buffalo. So uh, let's go ahead and go to campus. everything. So uh, the first thing you want to do when you get to whatever location you're filming in is uh, your pre-flight. And now this consists of several things. Not only do you have to worry about the drone, but you also have to have spatial awareness. So uh, with the Inspire, uh, I do several checks before I uh, proceed to film. Um, one of those always being the compass calibration. If you go to a new location, you should always do that. Also, uh, always check the props, make sure they're tight. Uh, have the prop, lo prop locks on here, so that's not too much of a, uh, a big deal. Um, but you always want to check that. It's clear, make sure the props are on tightly, you have your prop locks on, uh, and just make sure everything's uh, looks sturdy. Uh, when you power on your Inspire, you always want to make sure all the gimbal gets calibrated and everything. Uh, the horizon is level when the gimbal is finished calibrating. You always want to try to start up on a flat surface. When you get to the field, you'll always want to turn your remote on first. So click once, hold, and your remote will power on. This is important. You never want to power on the Inspire before you power onto the remote. So before uh, installing my battery, uh, you should always check and make sure there's no poofiness to your battery. So uh, this should be really firm uh, because it, if it has bulged out at all, that could be a sign of a bad battery. Um, lipos can be uh, rather risky. Um, you want to make sure you follow the proper procedures. And uh, just doing a quick check, make sure nothing is uh, unusual about this battery is always a good idea before popping it in the uh, Inspire. Now we can go ahead and pop the Inspire's battery in. Make sure it's in there and click once, hold, and power your Inspire on. Now, I'm using uh, an iPad Air 2 uh, for my filming. Uh, this has just about the top of the line processor uh, for uh, this type of thing. I haven't had really any lag at all, even with the new update, people have just been discussing lag. And uh, I have been getting a little bit of lag on my iPad Mini 3, um, however, the iPad Air 2 works perfectly for this. So now that the Inspire is powered on, and you can do this before you power on the remote or however you like, uh, make sure you plug in your iPad or Android device into the remote. So here we have it. Get that better in focus for you. There we go. 
go ahead and open up our pilot app. Now one thing you do want to do before uh, you go flying, especially long range, and this is recommended, uh, I've seen it on several forums, is you want to have your iPad in airplane mode. So as you can see, I have it in airplane mode at the moment. Um, but you always want to have that on when flying the Inspire. So we're going to go ahead and access the camera now. And this is what you want to see. Uh, you want to see the GPS calibration as normal, doesn't give you an IMU error, and you want to see safe to fly GPS. Now, as you can see, I do have full GPS on it, and I am, and, excuse me, and I am indoors. Uh, and then, once you have this all set up, you're pretty much ready to go. Alright, so you always want to check your battery level before you take off. This is really important. Uh, make sure everything's good, make sure all your cells are good. Um, and always fly with a fully charged battery is my recommendation. Um, unless, unless you've run half a battery down and you need to run it all the way down, that's fine. Um, but to start out flying, I always recommend with flying with a full battery. Now there is one thing I do recommend doing before you leave the house. Uh, and what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to go out of airplane mode and turn Wi-Fi back on. And now we want to access the GPS maps, so we're going to go ahead and do that. So we have our maps pulled up here. Now the maps aren't automatically loaded. Um, the maps actually have to be loaded up on Wi-Fi. So if I'm going to fly uh, down here, let's say, um, I'm actually going to have to open the application up before I go out, load up the maps, and then take it out. Otherwise you won't have a live picture um, map view when you are flying. It will still set the home point and everything, you just won't have an image. Uh, and so that's pretty important if you want to fly long range especially uh, when you go to a new location. Alright, before you take off make sure you have full GPS and uh, everything's calibrated and you're ready to go. So we're going to go ahead and uh, take off now. Once you get off the ground I usually raise the gear pretty much immediately. And we can start some filming. So one of my biggest friends uh, while flying the Inspire uh, is this dial right here. This is your camera tilt dial. Um, now unlike the Phantom, oh I guess the new Phantom has a camera tilt dial, but unlike my Phantom, uh, my Phantom has a touch screen uh, for the tilt and it actually doesn't work very well. Uh, but this tilt dial is amazing. Um, it is uh, very useful for getting extremely slow pan shots, uh, upward and downward pan shots. Uh, obviously to get the best um, pan shots and uh, yaw, uh, yawing rotational shots of the camera, you need to use the second remote control. Uh, but this is great for getting those really smooth and slow pan shots. Uh, and you'll I'll throw up a couple clips of those. While using uh, the dial wheel, you can get incredible accuracy. You can see my extremely slow camera movement at the moment. If I want to speed it up, I can. And this allows you to get really good flow in your film. And what I want to do actually when I'm filming a pan shot in a fixed location, uh, when I'm hovering, I usually start out slow, accelerate to my desired speed of pan, and then actually slow down before I stop uh, to make a really good transition. If you pull it down and let go, that's kind of a it's kind of a hard um, stop in the film, and uh, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, but then also, you start out slow, speed up a little bit, and then slow down before you stop the camera movement. That'll give you a great slow pan shot. So one thing I do to aid me uh, getting these pan shots is I go up to remote settings, go to RC control settings, go to gimbal wheel speed, and this allows me to set how much of a rate that my gimbal tilts when I tilt the back pan dial all the way. 
Um, so what this basically means is it's at 40 right now. It comes default on 100. But when I take this dial back here and tilt this all the way, it gives a nice slow camera movement. So as you can see here, I'm pushing all the way down and it's still a pretty slow camera up and down movement, as you can see there. But let's take this, go up to RC settings and set this to 100%. Now you see if I push this all the way, it'll go extremely fast. And this is not good for accurate uh, movements, it's really hard. You kill, still can do extremely slow pans, but I prefer to have it on 40 or 50% to give me that um, maximum accuracy ability. Any lower than 40% is a little too slow, uh, so that's my ideal uh, percentile. Filming is combine this up and down movement with the movement of the drone. So while panning downward I might be flying forward or backward, or while panning upward doing the same thing. Um, however, also climbing upward and panning upward gives you a really neat uh, look to your f film. Uh, same thing with descending and panning downward or panning upward while you're descending. Uh, another cool thing is being able to fix the camera on an object while rising. Uh, and you'll see this with the VT symbol right here. So that really gives you a good opportunity to get some cool shots. Um, one thing I like to do uh, without dual remotes, uh, well it's not as easy without dual remotes, uh, however, use the touch screen to pan the camera very slowly. Uh, and I'll show you the best way to do this on the iPad, but as you can see, I'm doing a very slow and controlled pan uh, just with the touch of my finger. So if you just kind of hold your finger there and do a nice really slow pan, that will give you a really uh, easy way to do a pan. Uh, for some reason, the Inspire doesn't like yawing pans. Uh, so that is uh, something really interesting. Hey, there's me. So uh, a lot of filming is done uh, down narrow passageways and close quarters with no GPS and things like that. And that's where the second remote for the Inspire comes in great uh, handy. Um, when I was filming at the falls, there was no GPS. I was quite cold. And the, the dual remote um, really helped me, uh, or my dad piloting the dual remote really allowed me to uh, get some film because I didn't have GPS and my hands were freezing cold so it really took all of my concentration off of the filming and on the flying and uh, having my dad there to operate the camera uh, was great because it allowed me to get those shots that I wouldn't have been able to uh, if I had not used the second remote. Um, in terms of following, uh, flying down the short and uh, narrow alleys or something like that uh, you always want to be spatially aware uh, of where things are and how far away the Inspire is away from you. Um, one of the biggest mistakes that people make with crashing these things is flying backwards. Uh, when you're flying backwards you don't have any idea of what's behind you and your camera is fa facing forwards. So you'd be flying backwards and fly right into a tree or something. I've seen several videos on YouTube of this happening. Uh, so you always want to be aware of what's in front of you and what's behind you. And you always want to have plenty of altitude. Uh, altitude is your friend in terms of not hitting objects, however you do want to be uh, safe in terms of uh, 400 feet, respect that uh, limitation. What I usually do <clears throat> while um, filming in short areas or small spaces, I usually walk with the drone. So. If I'm going down an alleyway, I want to be right behind it just to make sure it doesn't drift uh, and I can be uh, really in control uh, if I am really close to the uh, drone or UAV that I'm using. So let's go ahead and talk about uh, quick flying um, or fast flying. So the Inspire has a, a very high top speed. Uh, I've found it 40 to 50 miles an hour at times. Um, and this speed uh, is is great for long range stuff, but you always want to have altitude when you're going at high speed because uh, you may not um, recognize the objects that may be in your way. Especially if you're going really long range, let's say you're here, you take it up and it's really far away, there may be a hill that's far away that you may not uh, really see uh, and, and you can't really rely on the video feed or the GPS uh, to warn you of that. So that's why line of sight is important. Um, but not only line of sight, but you always want to have plenty of altitude when doing long-range flying. Um, 
you know, speed is great, uh, but I don't recommend it low to the ground, uh, especially with that spatial awareness thing. If you uh, fly it and you think you're far away from something, you may be actually closer than you uh, think you are and smack and hit uh, whatever object uh, may be in your way. One thing you want to be aware of uh, before you fly is your antennas on here. Uh, you want to make sure they are unfolded properly before you fly. Uh, and of course, if you are at a higher altitude or are climbing, you want to angle these upward to give you the best signal. And of course, outward to give you uh, maximum range or distance. Uh, now, obviously, this also can be controlled by how you hold the remote. Uh, now, this remote is actually quite top heavy with the iPad Air 2 on it. Um, I prefer the remote with the uh, iPad Mini, however, the Air does have, like I said earlier, a better processor. Uh, for this. I'm using a short cable. Uh, I don't like, well, I don't like, but um, I prefer using short cable rather than the app provided cable uh, that wraps, have to wrap it around several times. Uh, this I can just quickly plug in and not have to unwrap and wrap back up uh, before I use. So uh, battery life. So with the Inspire you get a pretty good battery life, uh, about 15 to 17 minutes depending on the weather. Uh, with the TB47 battery. Now I have ordered a TB48 battery that will be in soon. You get close to 20-22 minutes of flight with that, so that is a big improvement, especially when you're out in the field. Uh, when you have a drone like this and you uh, want to do a lot of filming, especially professionally, is a really good idea to have extra batteries handy. Uh, two batteries is good, um, but out today filming at Tech uh, I really wish I had four batteries or five batteries because uh, I was going to several different locations like the football stadium and uh, the campus and uh, just having those two batteries really only allowed me one 18 minute battery for campus and one 18 minute battery for the stadium. So uh, really having five or six batteries is ideal for professional use. Alright guys, so let's go ahead and look at the um, dual remote feature. So this is the main controller and this is the second remote controller. Uh, we're going to go ahead and power on the main controller first. This is always important, like I said earlier. Then what you want to do, and this is the way I do it, you can probably it'd be just the same if you powered on the, um, the second remote, remote controller uh, right afterwards, but I prefer to turn on the Inspire, so I'm going to go ahead and pop that on. And uh, after uh, following the process uh, of setting up your second remote, uh, you want to go ahead and turn this on, and you'll see it'll make a different sound. And it'll, this will be purple, and then it'll turn blue. That means you are connected as the second remote controller. So we're going to go ahead and bo get both pilot apps open. So guys, I'm going to go ahead and just give you an idea of how the uh, dual remote works. So. Uh, I have this set up in a custom way. Usually it comes uh, with two separate sticks and a different configuration, but this can be set up in the menus. Uh, so I have this control as yaw and pitch, and I have this control as tilt. So the right stick pans the camera, and you can do this very smoothly uh, to your liking, or you can do it quite quickly if you would like. And that's the nice thing, you can get that nice smooth pan shot, especially with the movements of the Inspire. And then I also have this as pitch control. So that moves that up and down. And the cool thing is you can get shots that go from up to down and pan at the same time. As you can see here, I'm tilting downward and til uh, panning. So that's a really neat ability that you can do with the dual remote. Now with this stick over here, the up and down movement does not do anything, however I do have camera yaw. And this just allows me to yaw the camera slightly to give you a cool video effect. Okay, so uh, we have our computer and we're going to do some uh, music uh, creating and some editing and I'm going to show you my process. So first uh, we're going to start out with the micro SD card. We're going to go ahead and put that into an SD card converter like so and we're just going to get all the film off of the uh, SD card and this is the uh, Inspires SD card so you'll see the screen pop up and we're just going to go ahead 
and uh, import uh, the video. So once we have all of the uh, videos imported, it will ask me if I want to delete the videos off the SD card. And I typically do. I don't need them if they're on the computer. And so we have them all right here. And uh, I'm going to go over here into videos, and I have uh, several folders. And I keep all my raw footage in the footage folder. And then um, I have a Winter VT, which is Virginia Tech. And I already have uh, film in here from earlier, but we're going to go ahead and pop in uh, a few more films that I've done. So I'll just take all of this and drag it right on in there. So uh, one issue I have is um, because these were taken later, these are actually uh, have been renamed to the same names that uh, these files have been given. So to uh, prevent conflict with this, I'm just going to create a new folder and call this Evening Shots. And we'll just go ahead and drag these into that so there won't be any uh, conflicting files. And we'll see our little progress bar here. Just so now they've been imported, and I can quit iPhoto. And you see in here, they're all in here and ready to go uh, to put in Final Cut Pro. Uh, so what we're going to do first, though, is um, we need to make uh, some music for um, the uh, video. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and eject the SD card. Just go ahead and get that out of the way. Pull it out the back. There it is and take the micro SD out. So I'm kind of uh, going to speed through this um, and show you different clips of this uh, because it does take quite a while to make a little bit of music. Uh, we're going to be using Logic X Pro and what I do, um, and I, I do occasionally play stuff on the piano and, and make uh, tones like that in Final Cut, I mean, uh, excuse me, uh, Logic X Pro. Um, however, uh, I usually just use loop files to make my music and there's tons of loop files to choose from uh, on the uh, Logic X Pro. So guys, uh, we're going to go ahead and choose that. We're going to go ahead and open up our loop files. And uh, you got a huge menu here of all the different loops you can use. Uh, so what I usually start out with is just a good sounding beat based on, or not beat, I'm sorry, but a good sounding tone or piece of music based on the uh, music that I'm going to be using in the music video that I'm making. So I usually go to Jingles. Uh, this is usually the best place to find what I'm looking for. So what I'm doing right now is I'm uh, going through all of the different tones and just finding what matches, and that's the best thing to do. Um, obviously there's different keys, so if I play this song, or this, this is not going to match in with the beat or the tone of this. So we're just going to have to find different ones that are in the same key. So much like this matches with this tone. And so these will be incorporated into the song. So once I find uh, kind of matching tones, I just kind of drag them into here and see if they work together. So that sounds a lot better. Now oftentimes what can happen when, I'm, happen when I'm actually doing this is I'll find a bunch of that works together, but I won't find enough that works together. And that's all just based on key. So um, I'm going to have to abandon this key and actually find uh, other ones that'll work together in this song. Okay, so let's go ahead and click on favorites. So these are all the things that I checked off that I'm planning on using in the music video. And you can see they uh, do match. They're all kind of in the same pitch range, so that's what I'm looking for. And I also added in some uh, strings uh, into this because I want to kind of give it a soft uh, beginning. So these will be uh, interesting to make the song uh, a little bit, a little bit different. I don't want it to be completely electronic sounding, uh, and also I need a little bit longer song to accommodate the amount of footage that I got at Tech. So now that we uh, have some some music in there, I'm going to go ahead and fade this in so you can hear the transition. That's a little too sudden, so we're going to go ahead and uh, fade it in 
Okay, so we're going to click up here and just adjust the volume rate. So this now should fade in. And, uh, I'm thinking this beat sounds pretty good. So now that we have the beat in there, we can start adding in more of a bass line, and that's done with the um, several uh, jingles uh, that I found uh, in the program. So so what I did here is made kind of a transition to a new tone. Um, so what I've done is I've taken the original beat and transformed it into a new area, and you'll see how this is done. So we go from the original. So we're still um, still playing with the original kind of tone there, but we also added in another element. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and copy this and paste it again. And once this has been repeated, it does a nice uh, kind of flow through into the next um, portion. Okay, guys. So I go ahead and I went ahead and uh, finished the song. Uh, it's about four minutes and thirty seconds, and uh, just kind of put all the transitions in there. And uh, you'll see this in the music video. So now it's time to produce it. So uh, what I usually do is listen over it again. So I'm going to go ahead and do that, and you guys can skip over this. So now that I've uh, listened to it through, I'm going to go ahead and produce it. Or what I do is I just uh, save it. And just name it something good and save it. Now that it's saved, I can share it on the iTunes. I share it to iTunes and I put it on my album where all my songs go. And if you'd like to download any of my songs that you've seen in my YouTube videos, let me know and I will send you a Google Drive link. So put it on there, share. So go ahead and uh, mix down all of the sounds and put it onto iTunes. And here it is playing in the iTunes menu. Okay, so now that our song has been produced, we're gonna go ahead and go into videos, go into footage, go into the VT video. And I'm just going to drag the song into this folder from here. So I have it in the folder so I can just easily import it. And there it is right there. And quit iTunes. And we are going to go to Final Cut Pro. So we can start our video. Okay, so now that we have that done, we're going to begin our process of making a new video, and I usually title my project the same name I uploaded the video. This will be Snowy Virginia Tech Aerial Film. And then we'll also add in the DJI Inspire on that. Might get me a few more views. There we go. So we're going to start by importing all of the files we're going to use. So we go to Import, Media, we go to Desktop, and we have our video folder. We go to Footage, and we're going to go down to Winter VT. You'll see all of the videos that pop up here. Right here many videos and we're just going to go ahead and select them all. Now we're going to go ahead and click import selected, import, and this will take a minute because there are a lot of files. And there we go, we have them all up. 
and this is where the uh, the thinking happens. So we also want to make sure to import the intro, and so I have a folder for that. And that is in videos and intros right here, and I'm thinking for this video we're going to use the short. Uh, snowy looking intro with my logo on it. I think that's the best one for this video. So as you can see there's the three shots and uh, it does work quite well with the intro. So once the, you take the time to uh, put all of these clips together just for the intro it really is worth it because you get this effect for your uh, beginning uh, matching with the music. Okay, so once I've uh, decided what is the ideal next clip, I place it in, and I go to the point, there's always a starting point. So when I record, I don't just start recording when I'm doing the, the footage. I actually start recording slightly beforehand. So this gap right here actually needs to be deleted out of the film. So what I do is I just clip that, and now we start with the actual shot that I'm getting. Now, uh, this is a rotational shot, uh, hopefully you can see that sort of, but you can see as I buffer through it is a rotational shot around the stadium. So what I'm going to do uh, when editing this, now this is a really slow rotation. Uh, what I can do though um, to make this clip a lot shorter is actually speed it up. And we're going to make it, uh, let's do it four times. And hopefully this will work out with the music. Uh, I see it's a much faster uh, pan. Now, if you notice a little bit right in here, there's a little bit of shakiness in the film. Uh, if you watch closely, you can see the kind of quick transition. And that's not really good to have, so I'm going to go ahead and sh shorten it just a little bit more. Use the blade and cut that out. So we don't have enough uh, time to do the whole pan based on the sound of the music. So what we're going to do have to cut. We're always going to cut the music on the uh, tone of the uh, or the sound of the uh, song. Um, we're going to cut the clip on the sound of the song, and so the way you do that is just listen for it. So right there is where we want to clip it and start the next scene, because you can hear that is the end of the clip. And see, that's where you start another clip. So uh, that's how I kind of uh, incorporate each shot, and I always um, kind of group the shots into what I'm filming, uh, and it makes for a neat um, film. All right, so I have every bit of my film put together. Uh, we re watched it, we've seen all of the scenes, we made sure it's all cut right. Uh, and now I'm gonna go ahead and share it. So I'm gonna share as a master file, which is a movie file. Uh, 5.36 gigabytes, um, that's pretty average for my music videos. And click next, uh, I already have the uh, name up there and we're gonna hit save and it is going to go ahead and produce the video and the percentage is right here um, and obviously you can't see it because it's rather small but it's at five percent and it'll be produced and it'll be ready to watch so uh, yeah so once the video has been produced we will make a folder for it in videos vt winter film and we'll go ahead and drag this into videos. And we'll go ahead and drag this into winter film. All right, guys. So to sum it up, um, always be aware that it takes a lot of practice and time uh, and experience to gain these uh, techniques that I use and other uh, cinematographers use. Um, and really, the only thing that you can do to uh, build that skill is to go out and do it. Um, having the right platform, like the Inspire or a Phantom, uh, definitely helps with that. Uh, so anyway guys, uh, I want to thank you all for watching and uh, you guys can subscribe to my, uh, inst or my YouTube channel. Uh, I have an Instagram. Uh, I always post stuff there. Um, 
they might be flying pictures. Uh, usually I post stuff uh, before I put it on YouTube. Um, my Instagram is uh, Lewis Flies, uh, L E W I S F L Y S. Yes, I know it's spelled wrong, but that's the way it is. So, anyway, guys, uh, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.